Hello everyone. In this video I want to show you some features of IntelliJ that are related to GraphQL development and especially related to GraphQL with Java development. And the first thing I want to show you is a problem that you might have seen already if you're using for example Spring for GraphQL to build your GraphQL applications. In Spring for GraphQL we have this mapping functions and the mapping functions are annotated with query mapping mutation mapping, subscription mapping, or schema mapping. And um, all these functions or methods that are annotated with these um, annotations are marked in IntelliJ as unused. You see this dark or light gray color here for this method names. That means they are unused. And we also see this in the problem view here, or this problem markers here, these yellow ones. So IntelliJ assumes that these functions are not used because they are not referenced from our code, but of course they are referenced indirectly because we have declared them in our schema file and at runtime they will be invoked. To get rid of this warning, you can go to one of these methods and then you uh, use the light bulb here. And from the light bulb, you, say, uh, you select suppress unused warning if annotated by org spring framework and so on query mapping in this case, for example. And now, wherever you're using a query mapping annotation, IntelliJ assumes that this function is in use even if it's not directly referenced from your code. Of course, we can do the same for all other GraphQL related annotations, like for example, mutation mapping here. Go to the function and then select suppress unused warning if annotated by org spring framework and so on mutation mapping in this case. So now every mapping function is not marked as unused any longer. If for some reason you want to remove this feature, you can open the preferences from IntelliJ and go to inspections and find the unused declaration inspection in the Java part here. You see here I've opened Java and then declarations, redundancy, unused declaration. And in unused declaration, in this settings here, entry points, you can find entry points annotations. And when you click here, you see a list of all annotations that you have declared um, in IntelliJ to not mark methods as unused any longer. So if you want to remove this, you can just select these annotations and then click on the minus sign. Or of course, you could also add other mutations here, for example, schema mapping or subscription mapping. Normally, I think it's easier to them directly in the code, but here it's also possible. And this will be stored in your ID settings, not in your project settings, but in your ID settings. So if you open another project, the same settings will apply. The second thing that I want to show you is a small enhancement to the HTTP client of IntelliJ that has been added in IntelliJ 2022. The feature has been added in IntelliJ 2022, not the HTTP client itself. To give you an idea, I create a new file like uh, query.http. And in the old HTTP client, we could write HTTP queries here, like post query, get query, and so on, by writing an HTTP verb and then um, a URL where we want to send the request to. And with this new HTTP client that has been improved in IntelliJ 2022, we can directly add GraphQL queries here. And to do so, we not write a HTTP verb, but we write the word GraphQL here and then the endpoint of our GraphQL API. In my case, it's this one, HTTP localhost 9000 GraphQL. And then we can directly add a query here without wrapping it in JSON or something like that. We can directly write our query as we would do it in, for example, Graphical. And I prepared already a query like this one, query all blog posts. My service is already running. So if I click on the run button here, we see the result here. I think this comes quite handy if you want to execute a simple GraphQL query. Of course, you can also specify variables here. To show you this, I use another query, my query number two, which requires a variable called ID. And to add an ID here, we can click on the light bulb 
and then we can click on add GraphQL JSON variables block. And that does nothing more than adding this second JSON block. And inside this second JSON block, you can declare your variables, like for example, in my case, ID, and the value for this ID is in this case, P1. And then we can rerun the query. And you see, we re returned or we received an object with the ID P1. So this seems to work. So this both features marking functions as used by, by adding the annotations to the inspection settings and this new HTTP client are both IntelliJ built-in features, but you can get more features by installing the GraphQL plugin for IntelliJ. And we can do so by open the preferences, navigate to plugins, select from the marketplace plugin called GraphQL, and install that. We have to restart our EDE. And now after we restarted the IDE, you might notice that we have syntax coloring here in our HTTP client, in our HTTP client that uses this GraphQL query. And the syntax highlighting is provided by the GraphQL plugin. And the GraphQL plugin not only provides syntax highlighting to the HTTP client, but to almost all documents in your IntelliJ IDE. I will show you more examples in a minute, but a second thing that the GraphQL plugin adds is an own query editor that is slightly more comfortable than this HTTP client. And you can open this HTTP client that is provided by the GraphQL plugin by creating a new file, for example, query.graphql in this case. And wherever you place this file in your IDE or in your folder structure, this GraphQL editor will open. And inside this editor, you also get syntax highlighting, but you also get code completion like you're known maybe from graphical. And the GraphQL plugin automatically scans our workspace for all our schema files and builds the schema internally. And so it knows what we can query here and how our schema looks and what we can query, what fields we have, what objects we have, and so on and so on. And of course, we can not only write the queries here, but we can also execute them. And to do so, we have to define where our server lives, or we have to configure where our server lives. And to do so, we have to create a configuration file. And that can be done by clicking on this icon. And then idea checks if we already have this configuration file. And if not, this message appears here, no .graphql config file found. And we can just create a new GraphQL config file by clicking on this link. And then we have our new configuration file here. And this file that is generated by the plugin initially might or might not be correct for your, for your needs, for your settings. In my case, I have to change the URL where my GraphQL API runs because it must be port 9000 in my case. That might be different in your, of course. To the other settings, we will come later, but for now it's enough to change the URL so that the GraphQL tooling or the GraphQL plugin now knows where to execute the queries. And if we switch back to our query editor, we can run this query. I have to, of course, start my service before because that has been stopped when I restarted the IDE, when I installed the plugin. Now the service runs and we can go to query.graphql in this editor and we can run the query and we see the result here. So this is quite similar to the HTTP client. Remember the GraphQL feature in the HTTP client has been added very recently. I think this is a little bit more, a uh, bit, little bit more comfortable here maybe, but many things that you can do here, you can also do in the HTTP client. And one thing that is important, if you want to add HTTP headers to your request, for example, for authorization, then you can do that also in this configuration file. You see this headers block here and inside this headers object, you can specify your own objects. Of course, you could, for example, write an authorization token here if you need one. And then this authorization token will be added to all requests that are done using the GraphQL client. So we have seen that GraphQL plugin adds syntax highlighting, adds code completion, and also adds this editor. And the first two features, code completion and syntax highlighting, 
we not only have in this .graphql files or in the HTTP client, but we also have this in other file types. For example, in markdown files, just to give you an idea, I create a readme.md file. And in this readme file, I want to add a GraphQL query, for example, for some documentation. And then I add the GraphQL language tag here. Unfortunately, I never be able to add the correct amounts of backticks here, but this is uh, correct now, I think, one, two, three, GraphQL. So idea now knows this is a GraphQL block here. We want to write some GraphQL code and also the plugin knows this. And so the plugin can help us writing our queries here because again you get the code completion you get the syntax highlighting and the graphql plugin knows our schema and can help us writing correct queries so this is one location where this graphql plugin can help you another location is your java code to give you an idea i write a new test case and in my test case i already have something prepared and I want to add this test here. And in this example, I'm writing a test for the Spring for GraphQL or with the Spring for GraphQL API. And the GraphQL or the, the Spring for GraphQL test API requires that we send a document and a document is our GraphQL query. And if I'm writing here, like for example, the word query and the brackets, then you see nothing is happening here. We don't have syntax highlighting that looks like a normal JavaScript. I also have no code completion here. So there is absolutely no help from the GraphQL plugin, but we can add the help from the GraphQL plugin by adding a comment here, a line comment that says language equals GraphQL. And this is a general IntelliJ feature. You can, with this specification or with this keyword language equals language name, you can tell IntelliJ which language now comes. You could also do this for language equals SQL, for example. But the GraphQL plugin, of course, is interested in language equals GraphQL. And now if we write our Java string here, the plugin knows that this is a GraphQL query and the query again is connected to our schema and to our configuration file. So it can help us not only with syntax highlighting and code completion, but again, also here, the syntax, uh, the, sorry, the schema is known. So it can help us formulating queries. Sometimes the, uh, you see the formatting here is really strange. I don't know why that is, but you get um, all the necessary code completion here. And of course, if you make a mistake, for example, you don't write ID, but IX, then you get also an error message. You see, this is an unknown field on the object type blog post. Um, and then you can fix this or remove the field, whatever you want. So I think this is quite handy. Simply add language equals GraphQL to a Java string, and then you get code completion and everything that the tooling provides. And what also sometimes might be helpful if you're inside a GraphQL query, and this is not only in your Java class, but also, for example, in the Markdown file, you can click on the light bulb. And on the light bulb, you can go to edit GraphQL fragment. And then this GraphQL editor that we have already seen before is opened here. And you can mo modify your query here, of course. I could remove the content, for example. And you see that the string also is updated here. And you not only can edit the query here, but of course you can also directly run it. So just to try it out, you can run the query and then you see the request here. So this can be very handy. I think for me, especially, this is very helpful um, in many, many cases. Um, this GraphQL editor is very helpful in many cases. And I only rarely use this uh, fragment editor the GraphQL plugin uses this GraphQL configuration file to, for example, know where your request should be um, sent to, or also you can specify how your schema is uh, should be detected. By default, the plugin uses all .graphql and all .graphqls files, looks inside these files and see if there is a schema. And if there's a schema inside these files, then it will read the schema and provide code completion for you, as we have seen that already. 
Um, and that goes more or less in real time. Um, we can just go back to our um, test case here. And let's say we add another field into our blog post type in our GraphQL schema. So I open my schema file. I add another uh, field here, for example, except this may be a string. And I can go back to our Java class and I can immediately add this new field here because the plugin picks up our has picked up our changes and provides us with good completion here. So this is almost in real time. Um, that is very, very helpful, I think, if you're building GraphQL APIs, especially in combination with this Spring for GraphQL testing API. If your schema is not locally available, because for example, someone is building the server and you are building a client, for example, and you don't have the schema locally, then you can configure the plugin that it reads the schema from an endpoint using, for example, the introspection API. And I will show you this in a second example. And for that, I will create a new project. Very, very simple Java project. Hello, GraphQL. Um, I think that's already enough. Just create a new project. And inside this new project, I create a new file. And um, again, we call it query.graphql. And now, of course, there is no schema because uh, we are in a different workspace and I have no GraphQL schema files here locally. But of course, we have the schema in a remote location and we can read the schema from this remote location. And to do so, we create another GraphQL config file. And inside the GraphQL config file, we add the again the URL to our endpoint, which in my case is localhost 9000 GraphQL. And we also set introspect to true. And in this case, the tooling, the GraphQL plugin, will load the schema from this endpoint and store the schema locally in this pass here. So if I change this to not to schema GraphQL, but to mini block schema GraphQL, because my application is called mini block, um, then the downloaded file will be uh, saved to this location here. So we can download the file by just clicking on this icon. And you see immediately the schema file is here and the schema file has been saved to this location. And now if we're going to our GraphQL file here, we get the code completion, we get the syntax highlighting as we have seen that already before, as if our schema was locally available. And of course, now we can also run the query as we have seen it before. The query then will be run against our configured endpoint and the results will be shown here. And all other features that I have shown you, like the code completion directly in Java strings, of course, works also with this now local schema that have been fetched from your remote endpoint. That is also very helpful if you don't have your schema locally available. Okay, that's all for today. A short video about the GraphQL features in IntelliJ and the GraphQL plugin. I hope you like building GraphQL applications. I wish you a lot of fun and success and see you next time.